Okay, I guess we'll get started. Uh, my name is Brian Lockery. I'm with an organization called IEDFI, which is the International Association of Digital Forensics Investigators. Um, first, a uh, quick question. How many, anybody here work in law enforcement? Okay, you're going to learn some of their tricks. Um, anyways, um, uh, we're basically an uh, organization of not just law enforcement people, but um, um, people that uh, do incident response, malware, and uh, malware investigations, or any kind of digital forensics for that matter. And what we did is we put together a uh, package of software, um, which is um, actually there's, there's several tiers to it. What I'm kind of going to do is go through the tiers of that software and talk a little bit more specifically about how we built the uh, facial recognition engines and uh, and what we use it for and how it all started out and everything. And uh, my iPad just told me I need to start talking. Anyways, um, why do we want to do this? Why do I want to do facial recognition? Well, facial recognition has actually been around for a long time. I mean, they had it out in Las Vegas at the casinos like 25, 30 years ago. Um, you know, they use it for other uh, incidences with, you know, law enforcement or, or uh, investigations, discoveries. So there's a number of criminal reasons where, why you want uh, to use facial recognition software. Um, we uh, have done cases where we have missing persons that we're uh, trying to track down where, and, and social media is actually an excellent platform for us because if we know who somebody's friends are and all their followers on Twitter and Facebook and all the other social networks, we can actually monitor pictures that are being uploaded to their uh, social media sites. If we're, not if we're looking for them, but if we're looking for like a missing person or something, we can uh, help uh, identify those. We've done cases for infidelity, um, you know, scams, fraud, and uh, Probably the tool that I'm going to talk about most today is actually one that's used to uh, do triage for child pornography. So it's the uh, one of the tools that investigators use when they knock your door down and come in and uh, start running the scanners on your computer uh, or computers or media or whatever you have um, for actually one of those tools. So um, and also it's been used for you know other instances such as human trafficking and things like that. So, a um, little bit of background here. The uh, There's a number of different organizations out there. The, the uh, Center for Missing and Exploited Children and, and the Amber Alerts programs and some of those that, that maintain databases of, well, Amber Alerts is missing people, but the, uh, the um, National Center for Missing and Exploited Children maintain databases of child pornography. They have several million hash codes. I'm sure most of you probably know what a hash code is, right? Anybody don't know what a hash code is? It's where you take a, basically take an image and compute like a big checksum across that image, and you can use that image to say this image looks identical to this other image. Okay. Um, we also so we use that database as well as, as I mentioned, we have a database of um, social media image codes, which is a slightly different kind of a hash code set, but basically along the same lines. And we also have a number of tools that we use to index these images, uh, tools that can scan hard drives and other media. And uh, more recently, we're starting to develop some tools that can actually scan uh, cell phones and other mobile devices. Okay? Um, believe it or not, we are, now, we are now seeing the transportation of images, you know, through cell phones and uh, other mobile devices. That yeah, question. Are those uh, within a certain range, or you can check in the network and scan globally? 
What was the first part of your question? Okay. Do you have people that are serving the grade on RF or something like that? Well, we're not, we're not monitoring your activity. I mean, this would be like a cell phone that's been, been confiscated. Okay. Yeah, yeah, we're not. Yeah, we're not the NSA or anybody. We're not out there watching, <laughs> watching everything you do. But in the same instance, you know, you could monitor like employees' computer in a company. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, before I actually, before I move on too quickly, if anybody here has uh, kids, teenage kids that have their own cell phones. Um, you know, sit down with them for five minutes because you know. Texting while you're driving is bad, but texting a a personal body part image through your phone is way bad. And I've been involved in cases where, you know, something like a 15-year-old girl does something with her boyfriend, and that becomes viral throughout a school, and she's she gets arrested. And the problem is. A, it's not one of those juvenile offenses that goes away when you turn 18. Okay, once once you once you get tagged as a you know as a sexual predator, that stays with you for life. And uh, unfortunately, I've seen several cases where that's the case. So, um, you know, if if somebody would find her her phone or his phone, or if it goes viral. Um, you know, it could very quickly spread throughout a school system. And uh, in fact, we had a case in Indiana about a year and a half ago where somebody actually committed suicide as a result of, of images that were on their cell phones. So anyways, just a little upscale on the phone, cell phones there. Okay, so we developed a product called Turbo Photo. We also have one called uh, Face scan, and what we've done is pretty much merged them together. Now, Turbo Photo is a is a digital forensics triage tool, which means. And are there any pure digital forensics kind of people in here? Okay, there's a few of you. Okay, a lot of you may balk at this because it tends to violate the uh, the rules of uh, chain of custody, but uh, I'll explain how it basically works. If law enforcement knows that there's uh, images within a facility that they're knocking the doors down on, um, you know, there's a whole chain of custody and everything forensics-wise that they have to go through to, uh, you know, to confiscate those computers and media and everything else. However, if they can run a triage tool and discover those images very quickly and get them up on the screen very quickly, the probability that they'll get a confession from the bad guy just goes up orders of exponential, okay? Because you're showing it to them right there on the screen. You know, it's not like you got to come back three weeks later with some evidence that you recovered in the lab. So that's one of the reasons why triage tools are becoming uh, more and more popular, especially as hard disks get to be larger and larger and larger. Um, you know, people have. Um, networks within their houses where they have file servers and um, media sharing devices and devices driving, you know, large screen TVs and things like that. So, um, also, you know, like I said, we've, we've used our, uh, our software within schools. Not so much, believe it or not, not so much for the students. However, we have had instances where um, you know, in one case, a student borrowed a USB um, drive off of the teacher and gave it back to the teacher, and it was full of bad stuff. So, you know, that's a, a violation of the law right there. You're not allowed to do that. Um, could also be used by businesses. You know, we've seen instances where um, people have been trading it through you know, business email accounts and things like that. Let me jump back to schools real quick. Might be interesting to know that some of the more severe cases that we've seen are actually the teachers. Okay, you know, that you think a school teacher, you know, teaching five-year-old, ten-year-old kids would be involved in things like this? Well, you know, put two and two together. 
teachers like to be around kids, right? So automatically you have, you know, the, I'm not saying all teachers, but you have the ingredients that, that now you have somebody that, uh, you know, likes to be around kids. In fact, in Columbus, Ohio, we just had a case where a pediatrician from the Ohio State University uh, in Children's Hospital, and this is a doctor that does uh, oncology, you know, cancer cases with uh, with children, and they, um, so actually some friends of mine did the bust, but uh, they, um, you know, they found about 60 different images on this computer. It turned out the computer was owned by Ohio State University. So, um, so it's not just the kids in the school, it's not just the employees in your business. I've seen cases where a business had some computers sitting in the DMZ, those computers got hacked and were being used to, uh, to uh, you know, relay child pornography images back and forth to, to other recipients and basically it sat there for about six months and the business had really no idea that these images were on their computer. So anyways, uh, getting back to the mechanisms here, we have a database of hash codes for many of the known images. We uh, triangulate that down to about 260,000 of them that we see often. Okay, question? So that, those hashes aren't going to help if somebody like resizes the image or takes metadata? We'll get to that. Yeah, very good question. Very good question. His question was, how does it relate to the size of the image and all that? Okay. That's the reason we use facial vectors. Okay, basically. Is that, is that um, <coughs> excuse me, um, hash codes are only good for a it, single instance of a static image. You know, they're not going to work if you change one pixel in that image. Okay, that's why we move more towards a uh, facial recognition uh, arrangement. But anyways, using hash codes, we can be very fast. So, for example, the software that I'm going to talk about today that we developed, and we're going to tell you all the tools and everything we use to do it. Um, we can scan a live system, the media, the hard drive on a system, and then actually one of the test systems that we use um, is a one terabyte disk drive with about 65,000 cataloged images. That means those images are in our database. Now, they're not all bad images, but they're just test images that we use. So our application is actually multi-core, multi-threaded. It runs on Windows, um, primarily because it's a triage tool, and most of the machines that law enforcement encounter are Windows machines. So that's, but we also have a Linux version, which I'll talk about a little bit later too. But anyways, we can scan that one terabyte disk drive, a complete scan in less than 40 minutes, okay? So you, you can hardly uh, image a one terabyte disk drive in 40 minutes. So it's actually a very fast software. Okay. Now, but to answer his question, hash codes are good if it's a known image or it's, it's an image that you see floating around on the network. Okay. Or one that's been cataloged before, like the, uh, the Center for uh, Missing and Unexploited Children, like they cataloged. Facial vectors are a whole lot better because they're like hash codes on steroids. Images can be resized. So, for example, nowadays we see a lot of people that take images, they resize them, they put them on their iPad, or they put them on their iPhone, or their Android, or whatever, and they, and they get resized. They may get, the color palettes may get adjusted. I think I missed that palette, sir. You may have a color reduction. So you might go from 16 million colors to, you know, 8192 or something. You may have an image that's been converted to black and white. The other thing that we're able to do is we're able to actually go through the movie, the entire full length, two or three hour movie, and pick out individual frames of that movie and match those against our database. Okay. Now, one of the things that, one of the hiding techniques that, that the, uh, the, um, Distributors of this um, material often use is that they'll take a movie, like you know Star Wars or something, and they'll put in the middle of that movie, you know, a three-minute clip of child pornography. 
Okay, well, law enforcement's never going to find that unless they watch all the movies that are on this this subject's computer, which there could be hundreds of. Okay, I've seen computers with you know, six different disk drives, you know, with four or five hundred movies on it. So, one of the things that our software does with the facial recognition is that we can actually go through a movie frame by frame by frame and match those frames against our databases. <clears throat> Again, I already mentioned we have some tools that will scan multi, or uh, not multimedia, social media sites. No, we don't spy on you. Again, we only use these for certain instances where you know we have a particular person that's a missing person that we're looking for. Um, we also have a database of different artifacts and links and codes from uh, from these social networks because people may change their profile pictures, their profile images. So your profile image on Facebook today might be different than what your profile image is on Facebook uh, next week. Now, law enforcement can certainly, you know, get subpoenas to go to Google and Facebook and LinkedIn and everybody else to get access to this data, but if they already have it at their fingertips, that's you know it's all better. So you know again, it's used by law enforcement and uh, used for uh, digital forensics purposes. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the facial recognition software. If uh, you don't have any background in it, the uh, there's a number of different technologies, if you will. Most of them pretty much evolve around building vectors or building points that uh, that are able to you know, map various locations with our face. And if you just Google facial recognition, you'll you'll come up with you know, most of these. But um, the one that we honed in on uses more of this vector approach where you know now you have predefined vectors that can actually map the face. And here you have the advantage that this face can actually rotate you know, approximately 30 to 35 to 40 degrees in different directions, and the vectors will, you know, can still be um, transformed accordingly to, to match that face. Okay, so some of our criteria, if you will, when we built these software tools, we wanted to use as much, you know, open source software as possible because, you know, we didn't want to have hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of licensing because our idea was to you know, make it available to law enforcement and private investigators and other people that use it um, you know, as low cost as possible. Part of our requirement was we wanted to have a body of software that could be used on Windows, Linux, and on a Mac. We also wanted the ability to use that same software on uh, iOS devices as well as Android. So, you know, that kind of pretty much narrows it down. Um, and we ended up using C++, A, because we needed the speed, and uh, we also were able to throw all the libraries that we needed into the blender and actually come up with some products that worked. So some of the back-end tools that we use, somebody asked earlier if we use Python. Yes, we do use Python for some of the uh, database administration management kind of tools that we use, kind of back office stuff. That's not, uh, we don't use, actually use Python out in the field for what the investigator is run. And we also have some scripts that are written in uh, Perl as well as some of our web interfaces that are written in uh, PHP. And one of, because of what we're doing and, and the the, uh, the speed that we want it to run in, you know, we want to build um, software that's multi-core, multi-threaded as much as possible. Let's do that. Let's do that slide twist. Okay. Part of, part of our other requirements was not only do we want to be able to scan images, we want to be able to scan movies, which I said we could do. Um, we also have some sort of what we call plugins that will allow zipped images to be unzipped, where we then scan you know, all the images that are inside of that zip file. We can also scan uh, 
compressed images that are in different formats. We also can handle various levels of encryption, primarily XOR is probably the one that we use the most, but we have some work in progress that will do some other things. And the other thing that we do is we build a tool that will actually scan the system and pick out the images that contain a face. So immediately we can rule out you know, all the pictures of, of you know, bunny rabbits and Niagara Falls and all that kind of stuff and actually home right in on um, just the files that have you know, a face. And we actually have a prototype in development that will say it has to have two faces in it or three faces or actually be able to, to pinpoint. So we can just start flashing those on the screen until the investigator sees uh, what it is they want to see. Okay, so we did some Googling and connect with a whole bunch of different libraries, many of which worked and many of which didn't work, and that's all part of software development. The, uh, but here's, here's kind of a, the punch out list of what we ended up with. There are some other ancillary ones too as, as well, but these are the primary ones. We used um, Live FF MPEG for doing many of the, uh, the actual image manipulations themselves. We use uh, Live EXIF to look at the EXIF data inside of JPEG images. And uh, we actually had a special case that we were doing where and when I start talking about our web interfaces, I'll, I'll elaborate on that a little bit more. But the idea was they wanted to know, based on GPS locations, images that were coming from a certain GPS area. Okay. And there was also an instance where they knew that one of the photographers that was making these images was, was using a, you know, very, a certain camera. And we could detect the camera's uh, model number and serial number out of these exit pages. <laughs> Another package we use is called OpenCV, uh, computer vision package from Intel, which is open source. And uh, another one we use is called TBD, which is our multi-code or multi-core, multi-threaded library that we use. And then we also use the C++ library called Boost. Does anybody use, ever use Boost? Anybody here a C++ programmer? Okay. Well, if, if you're a C++ programmer writing on really any platform, take a look at Boost, because Boost is a library of a lot of different um, um, routines that you, you, know, you just need, like regex expression handlers and and uh, things like that. Okay, so live um, FFmpeg wraps the functionality of the FF, FFmpeg program. And uh, so it's basically, we can call it from our application just like you call the command line interface. And there's the uh, link to the, uh, to the, to the uh, GitHub for that. Okay, live uh, EXIF, it's the uh, exchangeable image. For, uh, file format, and I won't go into all the details, but you can take a look at the source code there. Okay, OpenCV is a uh, open source computer video application, which is actually created by Intel, and there's the uh, the website there where you can get that, and that's part of the what we use to extract the frames out of the different movies, so it'll handle different. Uh, video formats and we can go in and pick out the different frames <clears throat> as well as the uh, uh, part of the facial recognition. The other package we used is called uh, TBD, the threaded building blocks that lets you easily write parallel C++ programs and that's also another uh, Intel uh, product. And now just because it it allows you to write parallel C++ programs doesn't mean you just take any arbitrary program and plug it in. Your program has to be pretty much written like it's going to be threaded code, I mean, at the get-go. So what we do is we have a number of different functions that 
or I should say not functions, but operations that we know, you know, when we first read the image in, we do this, we do that, we do the other thing, we're able to parallel those through the system while we're using the processor has, the computer has four processors, we'll use four processors. If it has eight processors, we'll use eight processors. We're also looking at using some of the uh, uh, graphics processors as well. Okay. Keep in mind that when you're when you're writing a tool, which is a triage tool, you have no control over what computer this is running on. Okay, because you're giving this, you're giving a USB stick to the law enforcement person who's breaking down your door, plugging this into your computer. So, you know, you can't. Ideally, we would have wrote the whole thing 64 bit, but you can't do that. Right. <clears throat> okay, so the TDB, there's the uh, link for the um, threading building blocks as part of the uh, part of the multitasking um, software as well. So it allows you to write scalable data parallel programming, has the mutual exclusion built in, has a task scheduler that handles all the threads, all the multi-core. Handles the memory allocation for you, which is a little tricky in a multi-core environment. And uh, uh, also has ways of manipulating vectors and mutexes and things that we're able to use with some of the vector processing that we have to do. <clears throat> okay, the Boost C++ library that I mentioned earlier. It has just thousands of routines. I won't go through all of them, but... Uh, if you take a look at boost.org, you can get a pretty good menu of what all the different routines are and what they do. So we, like I said, we use some of the different um, regex expression evaluators and different things. <clears throat> and there's the, uh, that's kind of the, uh, yeah, there you go. That's the URL right there for boost. Okay, so some of the challenges that we ran into. As I mentioned earlier, you know, 32-bit versus 64-bit. We'd love to have the whole thing 64-bit, but we can't do that. At least on Windows, the way we're doing it, we can't do it. Um, we have built it both ways. The other, obviously, the other challenge that you run into is you don't want to be linking to a whole lot of different DLLs and things that Microsoft can come out next week and change and you find out your your software doesn't work with those anymore. Um, so we pretty much, with the exception of just a couple of DLLs, we we pretty much built the software to be, you know, a standalone item that can load into the machine and run. It doesn't rely on anything external. Um, Certainly, some, as I mentioned earlier, some of the threading multi-core issues were a little bit tedious. To, since we're using existing libraries that were not necessarily written to be used in a multi-core, multi-threading environment, you know, it's a little bit tedious to throw everything into the blender and say, oh, you're going to end up being a multi-core application. Debugging can be a little bit more tricky when you're in a multi-core environment as well. So you, for the most part, you say, I got one core I want you to use. I don't want you to use any more. And then you do your debugging so you get it all, all working right. Like any software development, you know, you had to, we had to go through the whole cycle of testing, module level, unit level, regression level testing. And then there's always the, you know, the curse of the next version of Windows. You know, there's multiple versions of Windows out there, and there's 32-bit and 64-bit and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, we have to create one executable image that hopefully runs across all these different versions of Windows. Okay, so moving forward, what are the things we're going to, some of the things we're going to do? Um, more social networks, be able to monitor images that are um, shared across different social networks. And we actually have a whole other product that we put together for that, as well as some of the cloud services, Dropbox, SkyDrive, Google Drive. We want to add more artifacts in our database from 
Um, one of the things that we, one of the things that's not being recorded by some of the, you know, I can't say who they are, but some of the social networks out there is, is they sometimes strip out some of the EXIF information of images that are being uploaded, and you know that that can become valuable information to us. So we're working on some things to allow them to keep that. Um, also, because of the way that we do our database collection, see, law enforcement, if they find new images that we haven't seen yet, they can submit those hash codes and those facial vectors and everything to us. Likewise, we can get updates from you know other organizations that collect this kind of data. So it's a very distributed kind of an environment, if you will. Mobile apps, as I mentioned earlier, we haven't done a whole lot of mobile apps yet, other than we do, we work with like Celebrite and some of those where once the phone has been basically copied, you know, file structure and dev space and all that's been copied over to a, another device, like a hard drive, you know, we can then scan that data just fine. But we don't have any apps that necessarily run on the phone we as it may to them. <clears throat> okay, social media stuff. One of the things that we then did, kind of the next phase, was we created what we call Turbo Photo Web. And what that is, is that's basically the same package rebuilt on a Linux environment, a LAMP environment, that allows images on websites to be scanned. And they can be scanned, you know, bulk, batch mode, you know, every week we go out and scan the whole site or they can be scanned almost in real time while they're being uploaded to the website. So, you know, with that, you can scan any kind of a cloud-based service, website, a, you know, a backup service, cloud-based backup service. And with that, we can use the, the image hash codes as well as the, the facial recognition databases as well as the frame-by-frame -frame movie scans that I talked about earlier. So, you know, who would use this? Well, anybody running a large web hosting facility, for example. Okay. There's, you know, currently there's no laws in place that say they have to look at anything that's being uploaded. Um, however, the penalties can be pretty severe if they get busted for, you know, having child pornography on their, on their customers' computers. <laughs> the customers get, get get busted, but the web hosting company, you know, has to then defend themselves that, well, we don't, you know, we don't look at any data out there, whether well, you back the data up, all that kind of stuff. Okay, so a little bit of, uh, kind of put things in perspective. I, I assume that you guys don't run websites like this, but Facebook gets about 350 new, million new images a day. Okay, so, you know, an application like this could, uh, we don't, we don't do Facebook, but an application like this could certainly scan every image as it's uploaded. Instagram gets 45 million new images a day. YouTube gets 100 hours of video every minute. Okay, so by being able to actually scan video files, we could, uh, we could uh, then pick out any video file that might have contraband loaded inside of it. Um, <clears throat> Twitter, I couldn't get accurate statistics for the rest of these guys, Twitter, Twitter, and all that. Tumblr, we have already seen instances of child pornography on Tumblr several times, and um, they, they keep getting their wrists slapped, but sooner or later, um, somebody's probably going to come down on them. And again, you know, you got, you got hundreds of other photo sharing sites out there, like Flickr and Yahoo videos, Kodak, and everybody's got a, a uh, photo sharing site. Now, the other thing that we actually ran into, which is might be more interesting to some of you guys that do uh, malware kind of investigations, is you can actually embed malware inside of images. How many of you knew that? 
it's kind of a recent uh, discovery that's, that was made in the last few years where people were starting to detect that because you can have text embedded inside of an image, you can actually have pieces, parts of your malware scripts living inside of exif tags and text descriptors and things like that that are inside of, of like JPEG images. Well, we're already ripping this stuff apart as it comes in. So it would actually be very easy for us to, to have a dictionary of known malware, for example, or known uh, you know, pieces, parts of various scripts that are containing malware and be able to detect that on the upload side. We've also seen um, XORD scripts that, that are superimposed on, in, inside of images using a whole bunch of different things, really. XOR kind of uh, encryption as well as you know, steganography and, and really any kind of encryption method. I mean, once, once you've got this image, you know, you could, you got lots of bits to play with. So you could put inside that whatever you wanted to. Now the beauty of it is, from a hacker standpoint, is how many of your firewalls and stuff are taking a look at any images that are coming down. You know, this thing says icon.gif. A will let it through. You know, it's an icon off of some website. You know, if it says eBay.gif or, or Twitter.gif or whatever, you're gonna let it down, right? And, and so there's now a lot of possibilities here. Now it doesn't include any facial recognition, but there's still um, you know there's still opportunities there for for a scanner that could could pick out that malware from images. Okay. So any other questions at this point? Yeah. yeah. So you said the tool primarily for a triage perspective, right? Well, the, the triage tool is. Right. We also have the web. Scanner as well. So you have a situation, uh, you know, post um, done an acquisition, you get in case, right? You got e files. Does solution have any uh, capabilities of scanning these e files? Oh, well, yeah, you can mount an e file as a disk drive. Okay. Once you mount the e file, the e 01 file or whatever is a disk drive, we scan yeah, it. In scripts or anything with in case that. Name. Nothing built in. See, keep in mind, we're actually pre in case. Right. Right. End case is phase two, we're phase one, right? And, I mean, in, 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 a, in a triage situation. Yeah, I was right? in a situation where I looked at a global company, right, the new acquisition, right, and they make sure that we'll do the e files, we don't have the machine or anything like that. Right. Probably right. not a triage case. So I'm just primarily in post, right? Yeah. No, what, what he's getting at is end case basically creates like a big container file of like a DD image almost with with checksums and lots of other things in it. And but there are tools out there that will let you mount an end case container file as as a disk drive. So once it once it looks like an X drive, we can scan it. We don't care what it is at that point. Likewise we do this we've done the same thing even with backup container files. So we have backup container files from um, um Sorry to think. Nero, 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 back it up, and some of those that we've we've done the same thing. Yeah, question. Yeah. 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 I didn't catch all that. You want to? Right, right. You can buy an add-on. I think there's actually Linux utilities that do it for free. <laughs> so you don't need to buy anything because we we run on Linux as well. So um, we also run on a virtual machine. We can run on a virtual machine just fine. So um, believe it or not, the multi-core, multi-threading actually works. But uh, but uh, anyways, um, we also run a network called InfoSec Mash, which uh, collects a bunch of information, security information, or I'm sorry, uh, 
you, it, it's it's kind of like a Twitter on steroids for information security people that you're free to join. Just go to this. Um, lost my pointer. Just go to this website here slash invite. And we, we use the Yammer network. Are you guys familiar with Yammer? So we have our own private Yammer network. So we have to send you an invite. You can't just join the network. You can uh, you can only join it if we send you an invite. But we actually post, we monitor about 6,000 different InfoSec blogs. And um, InfoSec and digital forensics blogs. And um, we post about three or 400 new links a day. We don't post the actual news articles. We post links to the to the blogs. But um, um, the reason we like Yammer more so than some of the other social networks is well, a it's private, so you know you can discuss things that you wouldn't normally discuss on Facebook or Twitter or whatever. But um, they also have some real nice mobile applications where you can get. You know, basically a streaming list of updates that are coming through. A lot like Twitter, but but you can also go in there and bookmark things, and you can tag things, and catalog things, and do all kinds of other fun stuff. Yammer is actually a company I think that Microsoft bought a few years ago. So it doesn't send you email every day unless you want it to. There's a there is an opt-in to send a daily summary through email. And um, but uh, but it is nice on you know things like iPads and iPhones and Androids and things. So okay, any other questions? Yeah, we have about ten minutes left here, and uh, since I'm actually a college professor, I don't mind questions. So go ahead, sir. Uh, do facial vectors change over time with age? So if a uh, say a girl went missing when she was ten, we had a picture, but now it's you know, she'll be twenty. Could we stand for her? Um, the answer is yes, yes, yes. Keep in mind there are application software packages out there that do age elevation or whatever you would call it, right? Where they know they can they can predict what she looks like ten years from now. So given that information, you could just as easily create a set of vectors. From the original phase, the five year plus five year phase plus ten year phase. And consider all the after death and decomposition. Could you compare a corpse maybe and determine the original phase? We've never been asked to do that, but but if the forensics people on the biological side were able to come up with, so you can hand create those vectors. You don't have to. You don't have to just scan a picture. You can you can create those by hand and then. You know, like one of the tests that we use in development is we got a whole slew of monkeys. You know, we got all the cat pictures, right? We got lots of cat pictures and we got lots of monkeys. And, you know, they shouldn't, shouldn't match, right? And they don't. Right? We, we also have a generic routine that says, is this a human? So we can, you know, we take it, we, we crank it down to the point that it says, and that's what we do with the, where we can scan an entire hard drive and say, I just want to see the pictures that are people. So, you know, forget about Niagara Falls and all that kind of stuff. Question? Uh, could you think talking a little more about the facial recognition engines you see out there and what the differences might be or anything about the actual facial recognition? Um, there, are, there are a whole number of different packages, but there were only Oh, probably a handful of the free ones. I mean, the open source, I don't want to say free, but the open source ones. There are some very elaborate systems that you can pay for. But because of the environment that we are in, you know, we didn't want licensing requirements where, you know, we'd have to. What's that? Um, well, I don't remember off the top of my head. It was a couple of years ago we did the Googling. But um, the, other, I see, the other criteria we had was that it had to be able to run the multi-core environment as well. And that, that's the open, because the open CV stuff was Intel, and Intel also made the TDD package, right? The two of them seamlessly worked together with, you know, like zero modification on our part. But, um, um, you know, I'm sure 
and it wasn't just me that developed. I mean, there were some other developers that worked on it as well. So, if you want to send me my business cards up here, if you want to send me an email, I'll, I'm sure we have a list of, in Evernote somewhere of all the different packages we looked at. Let's go over here. Yeah. Uh, you talk about the hashes of known files that are known bads. Yes. I mean, is the those are static hashes. Yes. Yeah. Are, are yeah. they? Is that considered proprietary? Is that considered private? Or is that something that's published? Because let's say that maybe I've mapped out 10,000 hard drives uh -huh. and I still have MD5s and SHA-1s of every single file I've ever seen. I mean, would, I mean, wouldn't that, to the public, wouldn't those be beneficial for me to be able to go and use those MD5s? Or are they kept private because of their... Well, I would think so. But... For some reason, some of the, I don't mention their names, but for some reason, some of the organizations like to keep them private. Okay. Now, since we're working with the investigators directly, we get those coming in. That I mean, where we get our, you know, we don't sit around scanning child porn all day. I mean, that's not, that's not where we get our, our hash codes from, right? We actually get our hash codes submitted back to us. Once people start using our tool and they see how fast it is and everything and how beneficial it is, it's in their best interest to give us hash codes. Which, I mean, if I happen to be a forensic specialist and well vetted in the community, which organization do you join to where you could get that list? That's ours. I okay. identify. Just, just ask. Yeah. yeah. But, like, like, you know, in case has a... Uh, a library that they've collected over the years, right? I think, um, what, FTK, I don't know, do they have one too, maybe? Okay. See, we're, we're, we're not all that interested in, in hash codes. If you've got some, I'd love to have them. We're more interested in facial recognition, because that's, that's what separates the, you know, the static images from the dynamic images. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. I have a question. Um, oh, you have a question? <laughs> oh, I thought you were giving me the five minute warning. I'm sorry. Go ahead. So you, you developed this application and for your purposes you use it to uh, you know detect child pornography. Uh, right. but, but let's say that I work for an organization that would also benefit from being able to scan images and do facial recognition and hashing, but that wasn't child pornography maybe wasn't my mission. So, is what you wrote available for me to use? Yeah, we can, yeah we can talk about it. Yeah. Okay, yeah, it's not open source, right? Yeah, we can talk about it. And part of the reason is, is exactly what he pointed out is that you know we're we're collecting hash codes from right. law enforcement and these different. Well, agencies. no, I would be I would be building my own hash library, yeah. right? I just just the application. We actually have a tool that does it. Well, we'll scan an entire hard drive and hash everything on it. So. Right. Yeah, I mean we can, but then that's the easy part, right? <laughs> it's just an hash code. Right, but say if I was hunting terrorists, right? Exactly. <laughs> you know, I wouldn't need your hashes. I would be building my own hashes, right. but I would certainly need your application. Right. Right. Okay. Question. Um, talking about the data forensics, um, do you do any like raw data translation into facial vectors? Does that what, do you, what do you call it, raw data? So. Just pure data off of a hard drive, like un, I can say unformatted, but um, not from a file. Table. As in discovery, as in yeah. looking for like Slack, things. like Slack space and things along those lines. Well, there are a number of tools, a number of the, of the forensics, um, you know, distributions out there will scan the Slack space in. If it looks like an image, calls it an image and creates a file, right? We can then run against that collection of images and say, you know, yes, it matches or you no, know, it doesn't. And if you're just wanting images, there's ones that are open source right. that you can run. Like that. You know, like the design of your SD card gets in. Right. Yes. So I guess, I guess I'm thinking check. more along the lines of how much of an image do you need to create a Facebook vector? Well, you need the face. If you have a broken image. Just the one. You just need the face. That's all you need. So you need enough of, of the face that, that if, like for example, our generic software that identifies it is a face and not a monkey, and not a rabbit, and not a cat, okay? 
if you could, you know, if you say you find the, the, the GIF header or the JPEG header or whatever, you use a little bit of regex on that and say, yeah, this is a header. It's a little more difficult, I think, to figure out what the end of that is. But you could, you know, you could chunk it in such a way that you then run, you then run the application and say, does this match? No. Well, chunk it a little differently. Does it match? No. See what I'm saying? So, you know, in theory, yeah, you could do that. The problem is we're not an API. I mean, we're not, you know, you would have to have a collection of images and then say, either go scan this entire hard drive or go scan this directory or, you know what I'm saying? You know, we're, we're not going to go unravel the dead space for you. Um, you're not the first person that's asked for that, by the way. But, you know, that's where you get into end case and, and you know, let those guys do, do what they do best, right? They do that stuff. So once they've collected that dead space and they've identified it as an image, we'll be more than happy to take a look at it. Okay. Okay. I think we're down about five minutes here. Any other questions? Yeah. Does it also work on illustrations? Could facial rec Mona Lisa or Jessica Rabbit and more strange images based on those? Well, Mona Lisa is a bad example because it looks like a photograph, yeah. And that's one of the problems with using facial recognition as a security tool, is that all I got to do is walk in there with a photograph of you and I'm in, right? As long as that photograph's good. In fact, somebody just broke the the finger, what's the finger um, scanner on the IRS? Somebody just broke it by basically taking a, uh, if I can get a fingerprint off of a glass, you know, normal, normal everyday forensics, and they have some me some method that, you know, 3D printer or something that prints it out in such a way that I can now break into your phone, right? So, you know, it's the same problem. That problem doesn't go away. You know, if I've got a picture of you, yeah, and in today's world, I, I use a 3D scanner or a 3D printer and make it look like you, right? And, uh, you know, you're, you're going to bypass any kind of facial recognition devices that are out there if you have somebody that looks just like you. Yeah? What's your data store? What's that? What's your data store? Data store. What's, what's, a, what's a database? What's a backend? On the, um, on the triage tool, we use SQLite. Mm -hmm. And on the web application, we use MySQL. Okay, and you, you found that best for looking through hashes, or that's just what, you, like, did you benchmark and figure out what was best for doing this? We actually have another database, which is a proprietary database that we're prototyping. Mm -hmm. Thus far, we haven't found the difference to be significant enough that it warrants you know, changing everything to make it work. Um, the SQL Lite database is that sits on the thumb drive is about 260,000 images. So SQL Lite does a fabulous job with that small of hash codes. The web-based application is about 19 million hash codes. So that's a little bit different. Okay? And those are known bad hashes of known bad discovered files? Yes and no. They're actually a comp. They're a, they're a they're a whole bunch of things. They're I mean we we have a way of slicing and dicing as well. They're they're a known. They're all the known bad ones plus all the suspected bad ones, and I suspect that a lot of them may actually be some investigator somewhere in New Jersey just scanned the whole hard drive and said all of these are bad. You know what I'm saying? See, you're at the mercy of who's collecting the data at that point. So by the time it gets to you, everything's lumped together. It's not separated into, you know, definite baddies. This might, you know, different categories of severity, or is it just right? Like everything right. Like for example, the the Center for, you know, um, National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. They have no idea if this kid is 14 years old or 21. You know what I'm saying? 21 is legal. You can do whatever you want, right? Well, less than that, you're done. It, unless, you know, unless it looks like she looks like a he or she looks like a 14 year old. Okay, we're out of time, so thank you very much. I guess some business cards over here.